work at Harborview in the Puget Sound, and I'm going to be talking about hemostasis uh, in endoscopic sinus surgery. So just as a brief overview, we're going to be looking at before, during, and after surgery, uh, do a brief, brief review of the literature, and then take some take-home points with us. So we all do a good past medical history, surgical history. We look at medications and herbal remedies and extent of sinus diseases, issues for uh, intraoperative bleeding. Uh, but the two things that I would like to focus, focus on today are uh, the preoperative CT scan and preoperative steroids. When I do my preoperative CT scan, the two things I like to look for are the anterior ethmoid artery and the internal carotid artery. And there are easy ways to locate the anterior ethmoid artery. Uh, first, you can look at the junction of the superior rectus and medial rectus muscle. You can also see that beak adjacent to it. And then you can also look at the back of the globe and the beginning of the optic nerve to really identify that location. If it's hanging below the skull base, I'm sometimes more conservative in it just so that I don't um, inadvertently come across it in the operating room. Additionally, I pay a lot of attention to the lateral sphenoid wall. This can be eroded for a number of reasons. We see a lot of inflammatory disease. Things like allergic fungal can cause erosion of that side wall. But that can also be a sign that something more substantial is back there. So if I see something like this, I will oftentimes uh, do an MRI preoperatively as well just to make sure I don't have any intraoperative surprises. Four weeks of intranasal corticosteroids using memetazone BID can decrease blood loss in the operative time, even in patients without polyps, so chronic rhinosinusitis without nasal polyposis. We don't have great data for oral steroids, but occasionally I will use it if I see substantial inflammation. Additionally, we, we do have good data in randomized control trials that uh, preoperative oral steroids can be useful in some situations, as well as intranasal corticosteroids. And the most common doses are between 30 and 40 milligrams for four to seven days before surgery. In the operating room, I pay attention to the anesthetic, my positioning, use of topical decongestants, and things like intra, uh, cauterization. In a systematic review of nine randomized control trials, there is better visibility with total IV anesthesia, and that would be something like propofol and uh, fentanyl or remifentanyl. Uh, in contrast to a fluorine or uh, an, an inhaled, inhaled anesthetic uh, with uh, short-term opiates. The randomized control trials, when you put them together, don't show a significant difference in estimated blood loss, but it's about a 60 cc difference, so clinically that could be very important depending on where you are. Take-home points for vaso, uh, topical vasoconstriction, avoid phenylephrine, mm -hmm. caution with cocaine, oxymetazoline safe, and topical concentrated epinephrine can be safe. Uh, but be careful in cardiovascular patients. The state of New York did a big review of oxymetazoline versus phenylephrine, and they found nine cases of morbidity and mortality associated with phenylephrine, and these involved cases of hypertensive crises and pulmonary edema. They did not have any events with afrin, or sorry, with oxymetazoline. So in kids, this is the first line. A lot of science surgeons really uh, like to use concentrated epinephrine, 1 to 1,000. Again, take this with caution. I like to use fluorescein added to the epinephrine so it turns yellow, and that way I can see it. And if someone gives me a syringe full of yellow uh, solution, I don't inject it. 20 degrees of reverse Trendelenburg can increase your uh, visibility and decrease blood loss compared to 10 degrees or even 5 degrees of uh, reverse Trendelenburg. And this was shown in a randomized control, a double blind randomized control trial. I also use submucosal injections. Typically, how do you make that? How do you make it blind? Um, I, I typically use submucosal injections using a 25 gauge uh, a needle um, with a 45 degree angle, and I go from back to, to front using the uh, uh, injecting near the root of the middle turbinate, and then along the middle turbinate, and then uh, at the axilla and the lateral wall. We have lots of great absorbable packing options for intraoperative hemostasis in general. These are very fast. Um, but they're generally not necessary in most cases. We have them if we need them. Some of them are associated with more of a inflammatory response than others, specifically uh, bovine-derived gelatin and human-derived thrombin. It tends to have a little bit more of a reactive process. We worry a little bit more about scarring and senechia afterwards than some of our other agents out there. Finally, in, in the, by and large, in most cases, you really don't need packing. If you do need it, it doesn't appear to do much in terms of wound healing, either 
for or against. Um, but randomized control trials, again, have shown that there's really no difference in these post-op uh, bleeding events. So use it if you need it. Um, I like to cauterize suspicious sites. So specifically, if I'm taking the middle turbinate, I will cauterize the root of the middle turbinate. If I'm taking a large sphenoid os and I'm going to injure the inferior portion there, I will cauterize below there because there's a posterior septal branch of the sphenopalatine artery that comes across that location. So in conclusion, we have lots of choices, lots of options for minimizing blood loss and surgery. We have several randomized control trials that show that we have a lot of potential um, best practices out there and that things like packing are useful if you need it, but certainly are not often necessary. And I think, all right.